Hello, chemistry community, and welcome to Ever Wonder, the only show that gets talking about the hot stuff in college chemistry. Puns, anybody? Puns? <laughs> Jokes aside, thermal chemistry. What is it? Why is it such a hot topic? And why does it matter to us? Well, to begin with, we need to understand what exactly is thermal chemistry. Thermal chemistry is the study of heat released or absorbed by chemical reactions and physical changes. Simple enough. But how exactly do we study heat exchange? Well, that, my friends, is where enthalpy kicks in. Enthalpy is the amount, I don't mind that, of heat released or absorbed at constant pressure, normal lab conditions. But do mind that at constant pressure because it is necessary when we calculate enthalpy. Without a constant pressure, we aren't necessarily solving for enthalpy. Rather, we would be solving for Q at a constant pressure, which is equivalent to delta H, where Q means energy from heat, or simply put, heat, and H means enthalpy. And as we know, energy is measured in joules, or in some cases, calories. However, before we continue, we would need to differentiate heat from temperature. Most people assume temperature is the same thing, but no, my friends. In thermodynamics, temperature is the average sum of energy, kinetic energy to be precise, of a substance particles, while heat is a diffusion of energy due to a temperature gradient. Think of it this way, heat is the flow of energy from a hot place to a cooler place. Now that we understand what heat, temperature, and enthalpy mean, we can begin to see how things are being heated up. What I mean is, that depending on the process being heated up or cooling down, we can begin to visualize in which direction chemical reactions are going to. Reactions with enthalpies having negative values are exothermic, meaning heat is being released, exo, exit, while surroundings warm up. While on the other hand, reactions with enthalpies having positive values are endothermic, meaning heat is being absorbed, endo, entering while the surroundings cool off. Take a look at these cylindrical systems. On the top cylinder, the heat release is warming up the surrounding, but due to its loss of energy, the system is cooling. On the bottom cylinder, the system receiving energy is being warmed up, while the surrounding that lost its heat is cooling down. But how does it matter in chemistry? Take a look at this temperature heat graph. It measures how temperature changes when heat is applied over time. Initially, if we began to apply heat to the system, the temperature will rise. However, there is a certain period where heat being applied will not change the temperature at all. For example, when we are at solid, say ice turning into liquid, there is something going on. But it doesn't end there. Say our compound can absorb more heat, the temperature will continue to rise and then reach another plateau. What is going on here is a phase change. Substances can transform from a solid to a liquid by enthalpy of melting, also known as fusion, liquid to a vapor from enthalpy of vaporization, even solid to vapor from enthalpy of sublimation, never mind my type of sublimination. As you may have noticed, we are assuming that this temperature heat graph is only going from left to right, every increase in the amount of heat to our system. Surely this endothermic path will continue, but what would happen if we reverse the direction? Instead of adding heat, we remove heat through exothermic processes. As a result, our chart will move from right to left, and like my AP physics teacher says, BOOM! Things have reversed. Our enthalpy of fusion has turned into enthalpy of freezing, vaporization to condensation, and sublimation to deposition. These three pair of phase changes occurs at the same time, but are different. This is why. Let's analyze the enthalpy of melting, also known as fusion, and enthalpy of freezing. Fusion happens when H liquid is the final state, minus H solid, the initial state. Freezing occurs as the reverse, by having H solid as the final state, and H liquid as the initial state. You guys probably picked up on the pattern already. Depending on which physical state is final and initial, we will get different phase changes. We can therefore anticipate vaporization and condensation as vaporization happening when H gas vapor is the final state minus H liquid as the initial state. Condensation is just the reverse, where H liquid is the final state and H vapor is the initial. Tying back exo endothermic reactions, notice the directions these processes undergo on the little graph at the top left. Phase changes that undergo exothermic reactions are cooling down from releasing heat, which is why it has a negative VE value. All phase changes that undergo endothermic reactions are warming up from absorbing heat, earning them a positive VE value. Although sublimation, never mind my spelling again, and depositions aren't commonly used to describe physical changes in normal conversation, take a look at this. Deposition happens when a vapor exothermically turns into a solid, sublimation is vice versa, and solid endothermically changes into vapor. But there is another way to calculate for these two phase changes. Rather than just looking at its final and initial state, 
we can consider the substance of both. For many compounds that we know, in order for a solid to become a gas, it undergoes fusion and vaporization, while turning a gas into solid undergoes condensation and freezing. We can consider these substeps as another final and initial state, and still be able to calculate for sublimation and deposition. But do keep in mind, unless told so, not all chemical reactions undergo this process. Dry ice or card ice is solid carbon dioxide. It is known as dry ice because carbon dioxide does not have a liquid state. Therefore, it can only undergo deposition and sublimation. As you may have realized, final and initial states are often used in calculations. You can see this in the equation for enthalpy. Change in enthalpy is equal to its final enthalpy minus its initial enthalpy. But should we only consider the final and initial state without regarding the path taken to reach these states, then what we have here is a state property. State properties have values determined by its current state. It is independent on the path taken to reach that state. And what do you know? Enthalpy is a state property or function. I did mention how sublimation and deposition have substeps, but it is still a straight point A to point B path that just happens to be split by its previous phase changes. Now that we have a solid understanding of the initial final state concept, there are three methods to solve for enthalpy. There is Hess's law, bond enthalpy, and standard reactions enthalpy. Hess's law simply states that enthalpy changes are additive. This is great for multi-step reactions. Take a look at this variable chemical reaction. We have reactants on the left and products on the right. A is made into 2B, B is broken up into C plus D, and E is made into 2D. What we want to calculate is the net reaction of these three steps in the respective order, along with their enthalpies. Our initial step of A to 2B can't be changed since it's our starting point, so that reaction takes place and we will give it enthalpy 1. However, in the second step of B to C plus D, we do not have 2B to fulfill the first reaction. Still, we know there's a relationship between A and B. A is two of B's, or B is half of A. You're probably thinking, could we multiply the entire second reaction by two? Why, of course. We are essentially balancing the equation, but this example we happen to use variables. So go ahead and multiply that step by two. We can rewrite our final reaction as A, due to the relationship of A and 2B, is broken into 2C. 2C isn't affected by the third reaction, plus, oh wait. We can't actually use the third step just yet. The final step is E to 2D, but not 2D to E. But you're probably wondering, the relationship of E to 2D is the same as 2D to E? Absolutely yes, but consider this. We walk up a hill from point E to 2D, but we can also climb down that hill from point 2D to E. What I mean is that we are reversing the process, and in doing so, we have also changed the sign value. We can make 2D turn into E, but keep in mind that we will also change the enthalpy value sign. Now that that is clear, we can see that our net reaction has been simplified as A, still being our reactant, will undergo 2 to C plus C, which is also equal to the net change of enthalpy in delta H1 to delta H minus delta H3. So keep the following in mind, young chemist. Reversing a reaction will change its sign value, balance the equation with the appropriate ratio, and simplify net reactions is what we're solving for. The second step uses a variant of the final initial relationship. In chemical reactions, we add the enthalpies of bonds formed and broken. More specifically, the net change in enthalpy is the sum of all broken bonds minus the sum of formed bonds. To clarify and why we subtract the enthalpies of bonds formed, we know that when bonds are broken, it requires energy. It absorbs energy, having positive value. It's endothermic, you know the drill. While bonds that are formed release energy and have negative value, making them exothermic. Hmm, it may seem counterintuitive, but it has to do with the fact that during a brief period when the newly broken molecules are free moving, they are in an unstable excited state. They need to bond with another element to stabilize, therefore releasing energy in the process. As you may or may not know, when atoms in an element go from a high to a low state, they release energy and vice versa. When atoms go from a low to a high state, they require energy. This digs into the quantum world, which we aren't covering for this quarter. Anyways, here's an example. For our reactants, we have ethane and hydrobromic acid synthesizing into bromoethane. No to viewer, we are concerned with using Lewis dot structures to see which bonds are broken or formed. Clearly, in order for the chemical synthesis to occur, the double carbon bond and the single hydrobromide bond were broken from the reactants. Yes, as you can see, they are not present in the product form. Bonds broken are therefore these two. Check and check. 
Just looking at the new synthesized bromoethane, we can see that one carbon has bonded with another hydrogen, while the other carbon is now bonded with the bromide. Along with that, the carbon bonds have re-established themselves in a single bond. So bonds formed are carbon to hydrogen, carbon to bromide, and carbon to carbon. Check, check, and triple check. Great! Now that we have identified our broken and formed bonds, we can use our bond enthalpy equation to solve for the net change in enthalpy. However, consider the fact that not all bonds are the same. Some molecules are more electronegative than others, so the strength in each bond will differ. Therefore, our given bond enthalpy values are only averages and will not always work for other molecules. Now, let's assume they do. We can have a pretty precise calculations, but not always accurate. Our third step is standard reaction enthalpy. This one is quite a doozy because all we need to have are reactants and products in their standard state and at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. Here is a breakdown for the following standard states. For a gas, it needs to be at one atmosphere. For a solution, the molecule needs to be at one molarity and one atmosphere. For a pure liquid or solid, it literally just needs to be a pure liquid and solid, no impurities allowed. For an element, it needs to be in its most stable phase, at one atmosphere and at room temperature, at 25 degrees Celsius. Know that this rule can be applied to previous ones. As you may have learned these conditions to be standard states in high school chemistry, well here's a neat trick if you haven't noticed it. Most periodic tables are designed to show the elements in their stable physical state at room temperature and one atmosphere. Take a look at Professor Lavelle's periodic table. Elements highlighted in pink are stable gases, highlighted in green are liquids, and highlighted in yellow, which is more than half of the table, are solids at room temperature with one atmosphere. This is how we will find these elements in nature, excluding synthetically made elements. However, you may also know that hydrogen's stable state is as diatomic H2, and prior its most stable physical form is as solid as graphite C4. This is something you can all learn on your own, determine the stable state of elements. As of now, we won't be needing to know the stable states of transitional metals. A more specific take on standard reaction enthalpy is standard formation enthalpy, which is formation of one mole of a substance from its elements in the most stable form. We want to know the enthalpy per mole, because standard reaction enthalpy does not consider how much of a substance is used in a calculation. Take a look at this chemical equation. We have carbon in its stable state as graphite, plus molecular hydrogen and molecular oxygen synthesizing into ethanol. After balancing our equation, we now have this one. We do our calculations and happen to find that the change in enthalpy is negative 555.38 kilojoules. However, this value is calculated for 2 moles of ethanol. We precisely want to know the enthalpy for one mole of ethanol, so we divide our calculated enthalpy by the mole of the product, which is 2, and we get our standard formation enthalpy to equal to negative 277.69 kilojoules per mole. Although not explicitly used in this video, standard formation enthalpy is equal to the sum of the formation enthalpy of the products minus the sum of the formation enthalpy of the reactants. This is a variant of the final and initial original formula for enthalpy. Only we now understand that the underlying concept here is to solve for the enthalpy formation of a mole. This leads us to our next concept, heat capacity. It is the heat required to raise the temperature of an object by 1 degree Celsius. That's hot enough, but like standard reaction enthalpy, is this for one mole? Was it a lot or was it a little being used to measure in this object? Who knows? Briefly, heat capacity is an extensive property, meaning that it depends on the amount of the substance for our case. So to solve this, we use specific heat capacity. All we do is take the heat capacity of a substance and divide it by its total mass. Specific heat capacity is therefore an intensive property, meaning that it's specified on a quality. For our purposes, it specifies a mass. So now we know heat per unit of temperature per mass. So we are now done. Class is over, week one is in the bag, and I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye bye!